Hey everyone, it's LS, and this is going to be the patch 10.6 notes rundown, so let's just get into it. This patch, apparently there is a lot of champions that are getting buffed. I'm assuming that not many of these are impactful buffs, but I think that it's very nice to see uh, a much higher buff to nerf ratio than what I would expect, especially because all these champions, I think getting nerfed doesn't really influence all that much, although I, I suppose Senna and Aphilios should have the, the biggest impact. I, I think that these four champions are most likely going to be... Uh, pretty, pretty sad changes, but let's get into it. Nivea, our ice duration increased. Our Glacial Storm ice duration, two seconds to three seconds. Now same as the Q Flash Frost's ice duration. So this is a little bit bizarre. I thought they were about to buff Anivia by making her R uninterruptible, but I, I guess that didn't end up making it through. I, I saw a lot of stuff on, on Twitter about that, and I think even on Reddit, so a little bit disappointing not to see that. It is still a nice little change, I guess, for her, but... This doesn't really matter. I think I think Anivia in competitive, not in solo queue, is one of the really underappreciated champions, but she requires the entire team to basically be on the same page and understand how it needs to function with Anivia inside of the team composition. There's a lot of champions like this. Obviously, Velkaz could be another one of them. Zareth could be another one of them. Champions that they're not actually that bad, but there's specific spots where they are really good, and they also take a lot of effort in order to work. Inside of solo queue, this change, I don't know how much it's, it's really going to matter. Obviously, in competitive, again, I don't know how much this change is really going to matter. I think that the change that they were intending to ship, and I, I don't know what happened to it, with the R being uninterruptible, would have actually been quite big, but this is definitely a, a little bit peculiar. Anivia, I do not think, is in a bad spot. I think she's in a very unique spot, very akin to, again, Velkaz. Aphilio, Severum's innate healing and Infernum's innate damage to minions decreased. Crescendum's and power damage decreased. Severum, the Scythe Pistol, innate resurgent heal uh, is now down to 3 to 20%. From 8 to 25%. That is, that's actually, that's super massive. Infernum, the Flamethrower, innate. Okay. Well... Level, so they're, they're, they're taking lots and lots of damage off of Aphelios. Crescendum, the Chakram, 30% to 173%, 24 to 164%. These are all really interesting changes to Aphelios. I don't think this is going to move him from the AD carry roll by any means, but I think Aphelios has been in a pretty strong spot for long time. I think, I think Aphelios has uh, he, been pretty much a meta mainstay. He's even had instances where he ended up showing up in top lane inside of solo queue because he was such a strong champion. I think that Riot dialing him back pretty slowly over the last couple of patches and now hitting him with this, I think, is, is really going to bring him in line, especially because other AD carries are starting to pop up, but they're, they're still not getting the amount of attention that they could deserve, but with the Aphilios nerf right here and then the Senna one, which I assume that we're, we're going to get to as like we continue to scroll down, this does mean that as other champions continue to get nerfed, ultimately every champion that simply isn't being played technically is, gets more powerful in, in a way in that they're able to come back because they're not being as suppressed by the stronger AD carries or the, the stronger champions that just exist inside of the meta. And we see this, we're seeing it right now in mid lane with Zoe and Victor and Azir and, and basically stat check mages that are existing. Orianna's resurgence ended up coming back. We, we end up seeing this typically in every single line, obviously in the jungle. When all the junglers start to be really bad, you'll see Elise and Lee Sin and, and champions of that nature rise to power before the meta ends up stabilizing out with some sort of a core. So when there's no identity inside of the game, generally the champions that just have the best stats or, or, or the best stats in addition to the best kits um, are, are going to be there. And when no one really deals damage, then it's just mostly the champions that have the best kits. Uh, even if they, they lack in some areas in terms of stats, it's generally outweighed by that. So I think Aphelios is going to be fine. Darius, W bonus damage decreased, cost increased, E cost increased, but now scales down with rank. Darius is crossing the line after the top lane and fighter item rework, giving him a light nerf with uh, emphasis on making apprehend an even more important strategic decision. W crippling strike, bonus physical damage 50 to 70% total AD to 40 to 60% total attack damage cost is also up by 10. I don't think this is super impactful. Obviously, he does lose a bit of damage on the trade and it gives you some resistance. I, I think that this change already just screams solo queue to me more so than anything. 
E apprehend 45 mana to 70 to 30 mana. So you will not really see any 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 aid on this until the much later stages of the game where Darius's mana pool is basically negligible. So this is a, a really big hit to solo queue. I think that for pro play or super high MMR, I think that Darius's generally aren't apprehending um, as a skill shot rather than as a, as a guaranteed form of engage. I know that sounds really bizarre, but usually when they're apprehending you, they, they're already on top of you. If they're opening with apprehend, again, it, it probably is going to hit a lot more than it's going to miss. And so I don't think that it's just a random strategical decision where I do think that at lower and middle uh, MMRs inside of solo queue, this could obviously be a much more impactful change. So Dar is still going to trade on you when he's going to trade on you. If, if we consider like two or three casts though, these mana costs going up actually does start to matter. Darius is effectively having his, his mana sliced, but he's generally killing you either pre-first recall or post-first recall. And I think if he fails to kill you pre-first recall, he's never really depleted out of mana anyway. And so it's not the end of the world. Draven, W to King, movement speed increased. We're buffing some of Draven's power in a way that experienced Draven players can capitalize on so we can muscle into higher skilled levels of play. W, Blood Rush. Decaying movement speed 40 to 60% to 50 to 70%. So he ends up basically getting boots tier 1, and then the later stages he gets boots tier 2, right? Uh, from this, ultimately. Which... It, it, it is nice, it does give him mobility and, and things of that nature, but I don't think that's what's gating Draven from being played. I think that Draven is one of the hardest AD carries in the entire game. And again, Draven has a mini game that you want to accomplish in order for him to, to sort of be worthwhile. Or anyway, it's for the reasons that you'd be basically picking him. Um, I think there's very few AD carry players around the world in competitive that can pilot Draven at the professional level of play. And for solo queue Dravens that use him to basically climb and just stomp through the ranks, I don't think that this kind of a change is going to be all that impactful, although I'm sure it'll move the needle up ever so slightly by allowing Dravens to get some kills throughout dozens of games or something that they may have otherwise not obtained in the early stages, and that helps accelerate the snowball. Garen, base magic resistance growth decreased, E crit strike ratio decreased. This makes me really sad because I think Garen is actually potentially competitively viable in very, very thin spots. Uh, but obviously getting hit like this is going to be a little bit sad. So he's going to lose actually a little bit of magic resistance, which isn't totally the end of the world. Judgment, crit strike ratio 50% to 33%. Again, this also isn't the end of the world. It might actually change how he affects his, or it might influence how he does his itemization. But it's nice to see that this change probably won't cripple him um, entirely. Hecarim, our fear duration increased. We're encouraging Hecarim to take more risks with match, max range engages. Our onslaught of shadows. Fear duration 0 0.75 to 1.5 to 0 0.75 to 2 based on distance traveled. So getting 0.5 seconds added to a fear is really nice. I think the AD junglers are already kind of lacking inside of the jungle right now. You obviously have like Lee Sin, which lots of Pro teams are picking, and then also at the high end of solo queue. Kha'Zix really isn't in that great of a spot. Graves does have flex potency. Kindred is somewhat okay, but again, it needs specific spots. I think that Hankarim is really underappreciated, especially because of the way that he can itemize inside of the jungle, and he can sort of fulfill different modes depending on what the team composition needs. I also think that he has a lot of synergy with meta champions, in particular ones that are in mid lane right now as well as some of the supports that are coming back. So I think that this kind of a change, even if it's not like super massive, or even if it doesn't actually end up coming into play in a lot of instances, I imagine that, you know, people are like, oh yeah, Hecarim exists, and they might just try to play him a couple of games, see if they like it, and then, I don't know, using some sort of recency bias, they're like, yeah, Hecarim, he's great now because of this buff, even though the buff doesn't end up applying in maybe some of their games, and he was just always the same champion, and then... Uh, somehow ends up becoming relevant inside of the meta, but I do like it uh, nonetheless. Kane, passive orb gain increased later. Last patch, we smooths out Kane's orb gain, but his transformation times shifted back later in the game, removing his average transformation times closer to where they used to be. Orb gain speed at 10 to 13 minutes into the game. Kane will increase his orb speed gain by 15%, rising throughout the duration. So this isn't what's gating Kane from competitive play, and in solo queue, Kane is 
One of the really unique champions that generally only one tricks play to good success at the high end of the ladder. No clue how he actually functions at the lower end, but having his his, his orb gain be slightly quicker or something isn't what's totally gating him from um, from being useful. Rost is really clunky, for instance. Rost is very, very, very heavy. He's, he's very slow for what he needs to do or what he wants to do. And because he's slow, it basically means that he only functions into enemy teams that want to come into him and allows him to actually have access to his knockup reliably without having to try to really sprint to get onto someone and not being being able to do so due to being so slow and being so heavy. And when I refer to a champion being heavy, I mostly mean how much gold they actually need in order to be useful. Ross needs his jungle item, then he needs a black cleaver, then he needs a death stance in order to actually turn into like the the monster that I think a lot of people think of when they think of Rost, just constantly sustaining through the enemy team, healing over and over and basically being unkillable as he's in the fray. It, he's in the team fight endlessly. Shadow Kane is a little bit interesting in that Shadow Kane is really, really, really high variance in competitive. And obviously in solo queue, Shadow Kane is really good. But in competitive, getting to Shadow Kane and then actually trying to make use of Shadow Kane against coordinated players, I think is just way too hard. So Kane has other issues that I, I'm not sure how Riot could ever try to approach balancing them. Again, I, I don't doubt that there are spots where you can pick Kane and ultimately Rost in competitive that do exist, mostly against t like heavy tank, heavy bruiser type team compositions. Comps that are very, very prone to him um, as basically a counter pick jungle when you need a physical damage jungler, but I don't think anyone is super eager to do that. Kindred, base AD, uh, base attack damage growth and mono region increased, W health restore increased, R heal increased. So attack damage growth is... Okay, she, she basically gets nothing, but it doesn't matter. Mana region, 6.972 to 7. W Wolf Frenzy, heal health restore 32 to 100 to 49 to 100. So this is kind of nice, depending on the amount of times that she ends up using it, based on her missing health. Our Lambs Respite, 200 to 250 to 400. So one of the changes I actually would have liked to have seen to Kindred's R here is that rather than just outright buffing all of the heal, uh, I, I would have liked if this was like an amplified buff to allies. I think that would help move the needle for Kindred um, and get her more appreciated than she currently is. I think a lot of players think that Kindred is also a very heavy champion in competitive. Obviously, we've seen Dragon X and the LCK utilize Kindred to great success. I think that she's also really good against a lot of the meta champions right now. But I think that a lot of professional players find it very bizarre to pick Kindred sheerly for her utility and her control rather than any sort of desire to actually truly scale with her. And I think that's where the disparity can end up coming in between is she competitively viable or is she not competitively viable. But I think Kindred's actually pretty good. I, I would say that she's A tier or they, right? I guess they're A tier, uh, potentially S tier. Morgana, base movement speed increased, E shield increased early. Buffs primarily targeting support Morgana since her mid lane is in a good place. Base stats, movement speed 330 to 335. The first thing I think of here is I don't, know if this was PvE or if her, it already went through and I'm just forgetting it, but didn't Morkana's damage to jungle monsters or something end up happening? I, I, I'm not totally sure. Or maybe that's actually in this patch. Um, so the base movement speed there is, I guess, sort of nice. E Black Shield, 60 to 300 to 80 to 300. This is also really nice uh, for Morganas that don't end up uh, maxing Black Shield until last or something like that. And even if you end up start maxing it second, it is still a little bit more value out of it. So I, I really like these buffs on Morgana. I I, I I agree that I think that she's in a I, I think she's in a pretty good state. Rise base mono region growth increased W uh damage increased later. To, uh, mono region growth is 0 0.8 to 1. W rune prison 80 to 160 to 80 to 200. The thing is, is that you don't end up maxing W until way later. So this doesn't actually do anything. It, it, it's basically a placebo buff. All things considered, it's it, it's irrelevant. It's uh, this buff doesn't doesn't this. All right, maybe he's getting a skin soon. Well, let's just remember this buff a couple of patches from now. Senna, passive AD per soul. Ah, oh, that's right. They have to bring him back for worlds. Senna, passive AD per soul decreased. Miss cooldown now scales. Support Senna is currently too strong, especially when she's paired with defensive tank champions. 
We are decreasing the value of souls as well as their cadence so that she can't just constantly harass her lane opponent, something she gets to do much more frequently when she has a tank to protect her passive uh, absolution. 80 per soul, uh, 1 to 0 0.75. Innate weakened uh, soul cooldown, 4 seconds to 654. Levels 1, 6, 11. So, I don't think this prevents Senna from doing what she's doing. I, I like that Raya is trying to take an approach at balancing it, and I like that it's obviously on their radar. I don't think you pick Senna and you worry about missing out on a pickaxe. I think Senna's kit is way too strong. Her healing, her control, her utility, her speed, every, everything that she does is so overloaded that missing out on some damage from her souls, especially early on when it's going to be less relevant, obviously in the, in the mid to late transition you'll notice the, the soul damage missing a little bit more. But again, it, it, it's not the reason that you're picking Senna, especially because of the way that she conducts herself in teamfights is is very different than just spamming autos over and over and over. And even even if we, we talk about ratios and other stuff that's going on with her, this doesn't, this is not do enough, uh, especially because fasting Senna is in its very early stages. I think that it'll evolve into something more as time begins to move on and more champions are explored. We've obviously seen some variations in the LCK with like Volibear and Galio. Um, traditionally, she's obviously paired with Tom Kench and things of that nature, but I think there's much better champions. Shaco, our clone, basic attack, uh, damage decrease. 80 Shaco is just a bit too strong right now. That's really cool. I'm, I don't think I've ever seen him. So we're aiming for a soft nerf. So obviously, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna preach to the choir here. I really hate when Riot nerfs a champion outright to compensate for something, uh, but then doesn't try to shift something elsewhere. I, is, is this magically gonna make Shaco not kill targets that he's using R to actually just mug or, or, or something? I, no, probably not. Okay, but like, why? What? Soraka. Q rejuvenation heal increased, movement speed uh, bonus increased. Q star cold total rejuvenation heal 40 to 80 plus 0 0.3 ability power to 50 to 90 plus 0 0.3 ability power. Movement speed bonus 10 to 20% to 15 to 25%. Putting some power back into star cold now that the scourge of Soraka top is no longer threatening time and space. We know it. So I'm still pretty uh, adamant that Soraka can be a counter pick in the same way that Soraka was a menace, like what Riot is alluding to here, um, in competitive play and even in solo queue. So she can absolutely still be a solo laner as long as everything sort of lines up. She gets a counterpick matchup because it, whenever she gets a counterpick matchup, the nerfs don't actually affect her because of the way that she conducted herself in that matchup and how the matchup tend to, tended to go. So with other champions continuing to get hit over and over and over, Soraka should still be in people's minds, and they shouldn't just immediately overreact to her last set of nerfs, especially because this is going to help her out quite a bit as well. Twisted Fate, W, uh, blue and red cards AP ratio increased. Uh, now there's a little more reason to stack your deck differently come late game. W, pick a card, AP, blue AP ratio 0 0.5 to 0 0.95 ability power. Red card AP ratio 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 ability power. These are really big changes for Twisted Fate. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be a Twisted Fate expert here. I do not know if this affects some sort of a wave clear with his red card with wild card combo, so his WQ. I don't know if this affects something if he has minion dematerializer or something of that nature. Obviously, the 0 0.9 ability power ratio gives him a lot more of a mix-up inside of team fights where he can now just blue card people rather than relying on gold card and thus not have to slow himself down or reposition or anything like that. So these are really big Twisted Fate changes, right? It does have to be very careful. I could see, given the current state of mid lane, TF could probably end up coming back. And even if he doesn't come back as a pure AP, we could see something like a hybrid because this is honestly kind of nuts. And when I'm thinking of hybrid, obviously I'm thinking of like hybrid items. Um, that's a that's a really I mean it almost just doubled in power. So I mean that's that's absolutely bonkers. Urgot uh, Q slow duration increased, E stun duration increased. With purge being Urgot's go-to ability to max first, his other abilities can feel crummy to use. 
Small buffs to Urgot's CC potential will increase his combo reliability even through tenacity and keep Urgot feeling like an Urgod. Q Corrosive Charge, uh, slow duration 1 second to 1.25 seconds. E Disdain, stun duration 0 0.75 to 1 second. I think these are Knife's buffs. Urgot basically only exists right now as a counter pick in top lane to like Gangplank. And outside of that, he's generally perceived as a pretty weak champion that there's lots of ways to play around him. I imagine that if more and more champions do continue to get nerfed and other changes do come in, then I think that he has a possibility to come back. I think if the Death Stance change does eventually end up coming through that I think I've seen on Twitter and Reddit, uh, that could also be really good for Urgot. Vigar, base AD, 80 growth and armor increase, Q base damage increase, attack damage 50.71 to 52. Okay, I mean, whatever. Attack, uh, all right. Attack damage growth 2.625 to 2.7. I'm really curious if this has a specific purpose other than just rounding out the numbers because they easily could have just done 2.6, right? But I guess they, they moved it up. Maybe there's something I'm not knowing about. Armor, 22.55 to, uh, to 23. Okay, Baleful Strike is up by 10 damage to every rank. These are really nice changes. Vigar is already a really good champion, and he often will end up appearing as Gandalf to save many drafts on red side, either as R4 or R5. Wukong, passive increase... And uh, again, to, 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 to go into specifics about Vigar, there is a lot of champions in the meta right now that like to hard engage, like to dive, like to use dashes, like to use all of these things. Vigar is a beautiful mid-game to late-game monster that in some cases also can win laning phase depending on the matchup. So very underappreciated. I also believe that I saw a skin that is like coming up next patch or something, and honestly, you just want to hug Vigar when you see that skin. So that's all I got to say. Wukong. Passive increases, uh, passive increases stats for fighting champions instead of based on proximity. W now has a dash and a decoy that mimics basic attacks and abilities. R can now be cast twice. Base stats, magic resistance, 32.1 to 28. Health is down by, okay, what? What is going on here? Mana growth is up by 7. Mana is also up. Recommended items reflect passive stone skin. Oh, is this the rework? Oh, it's, oh, it's the Wukong update. Okay. Oh, all right. Armor, four six eight levels one seven thirteen per nearby champion. Do five to eleven level one to eighteen per nearby uh, champion. Okay. Remove magic. No longer gains magic resistance. Health region now grants zero point five percent maximum health region per five seconds. What? Man in the mirror bonuses are increased by sixty two point five percent for five seconds every time Wukong or his decoy hit an enemy champion or monster, stacking up to eight times for a total. What? Uh, all of his bonuses, right? I, I, I assume that it, it means his bonus armor and magic resist. Or does it mean his health region, too? Okay. I, uh... I guess I would I would want more clarity on this enemy champion or monster. So he just doesn't take damage in the jungle or what? Crushing blow, bonus attack damage, ten to uh, ten to one hundred and thirty zero to zero point four total attack damage, thirty to one hundred and thirty plus zero point five bonus uh, attack damage. Well, that's kind of weird that it, it shifted from total to to bonus. Uh, bonus range one hundred twenty five to seventy five to one hundred seventy five. Uh, hit fast, cast time now scales with Wukong's attack speed, okay. Add a timer to the ability icon to show how much time is left to use the empowered attack decoy uh, CDR. Whenever Wukong or his decoy deal damage with basic attacks or abilities, Q, crushing blows cooldown is reduced by 0, uh, 0.5 seconds. Cooldown 9 to 5 seconds to 9 to 7 seconds, okay. W, warrior trickster, new, king, uh, kind of pure heart, added 300 range dash that can't go over walls, okay. Stealth duration, 1.5 seconds to 1 second. Poof. Okay. Uh, cooldown, 18 to 10. 20 to 6. What? E Nimbus Strike, 65. Uh 
max health, so he's going to just be a bruiser now. He's just, he's just going to be a bruiser tank. Which, honestly, with how slippery... like So all, all of these changes are basically saying that he needs to just be a bruiser tank. The fact that his E got changed to magic damage is really, really garbage. Because I assume that he wants to build like Black Cleaver or something now. And that means that his E just gets no value out of any of the armor shred. Bonus attack speed is up as well. I have no idea how he's supposed to be. I, I'll be I'll be completely honest. I have not been following the Wukong changes because just, I'm not I'm not a very big fan of the, the champion, and I saw all the stuff going on on Twitter and Reddit, and so I just thought it would be a mess. Um, I think this is looking interesting. Uh, damage per second, four to eight percent max health. It, so it deals sixteen percent max health plus one point one total attack damage. And I assume if he shreds you before activating, I mean, this is, does he build lethality? No, he can't. He wants to build, like, bruiser tech. What is going on? Spin movement speed, 20%. Spin cancellation after 0 0.5. Damage for tech, 0 .5. okay. Distance to target while spinning. Doesn't move her body like a, what? Wukong can now cast other abilities to cancel his ultimate, stopping its spin. Keep on spinning. Wukong's one of attack speed duration from E. Nimbus strike is refreshed while spinning. I'll be honest, I, I have no idea what this actually means. Um, I, I, I really have no idea. The, the fact that he's like a bruiser assassin type thingy, I guess is really interesting because we don't sort of have one of those except for Orn. Um, so that, that is weird. Uh, I'm having a really hard time visualizing, um, how he's actually going to work and function. There's a chance that he's just way too heavy of a champion. And given that I mean, his okay, so so sure, his resistance is really goes up, but what does that really mean in mid-game? I mean, obviously, he's going to be really tanky, but, like, I don't know. I guess he could go Phase Rush with Nimbus Cloak inside of the jungle, and then he could have Smite, uh, and that would be a really reliable way to proc it, and then I guess he could be pretty sticky as, a like, a bruiser. He, is he just a weird, really weird, more reliable version of Hecarim? I, I don't know... I, I actually, my, I, I think my brain just broke. I'm going to move on. Xerath, center damage amp increased. Our damage per shot increased later. We want to buff Xerath's uh, more precise sniper-oriented abilities to reward skilled Xerath players for mastering their aim. Eye of Destruction, 50% to 66.7% increase. Um, this is a really interesting thing. I, I feel like uh, Riot just won't ever do 6 point, or 66.6 .6 or 6.66. And every single stat and in infographic I've ever seen I don't think I've ever seen six point uh, or six six point six, um, which I mean, okay, it's whatever. Uh, our right of the arcane uh, damage per shot two hundred to two hundred eighty plus zero point four three ability power to two hundred to three hundred plus zero point four five ability power, so zero point zero two uh, AP ratio, but ends up getting a little bit more damage. So. If you hit all of the abilities, these are nice little buffs for Xerath. I think Xerath already can function uh, for the same exact thing that I said above about Anivia. He's in the same exact boat as Anivia, Ziggs, Vel'Koz, uh, and then him. Uh, I, I think that basically those champions make up the champs that are really, really, really hard to play, have insanely high skill ceilings, and also require teammates to sort of have a, a really good idea of what's going on um, and how to function the game around them. Jungle Champions. Continuing with the third route of changes to diversify and widen the jungle champion pool. You notice that Morgana is getting a specific change with her, uh, w uh, with her to have her be viable inside of the jungle. You notice that Morgana is getting a specific change to have her be viable in the jungle along buffs to her main role. We're monitoring the effect of these changes to assure that they're not overwhelmingly affecting anything at the higher rungs of the skill ladder. Okay. Passive brand Blaze Monster now deals 120% damage to monsters. Morgana, W Torment to Shadow Monster damage now deals 150% to Monster Shen. Pilot Assault 75 to 175, so he ends up getting uh, 25. Uh, or no, I'm sorry. Whoa. He's getting way more than that. What is going on? He's getting 40 damage per rank, so if he uses it, that, that's actually quite big for Shen, especially if you build Cinder, Cinder Hulk, and Cinder Hulk just got a buff. Timo Q blinding dart duration. I I'll be completely honest. I have no idea uh, about Timo's viability inside of the jungle. York Shepherd of the Souls final service. York now raises a grave on large monster deaths and mist walkers take fifty percent reduced damage from monsters. 
So out of all of these champions, I think that the most likely to end up inside of the jungle is Zyra, Yorick, Brand, and Morgana. I think that Teemo and Shen are very niche, although I do think that Shen is probably like a B or like a lower tier A level jungle. Um, all things considered, I just think that people won't want to work with how he functions actually as a jungler, even though I think I, I, I think he can actually be very good in competitive. Obviously in solo queue, stay away. But I, I do like all of these changes. I think Yorick or, has already had the ability to sort of be a jungler. I think there's actually a high-low jungle player uh, that primarily only mains Yorick jungle. Zyra plants now deal 100% damage to monsters. I've heard that Zyra's somewhat good inside of the jungle, but I, I know that people have already been trying to make brand work inside of the jungle, and playing him inside of the jungle helps actually mitigate a lot of his weaknesses, so that's nice. Funnel mechanics, uh, minion gold penalty, 13 less gold to 13 less gold and 50% less XP. Uh, that's really nice. That funnel continues to get hit, I guess. Top lane significance, uh, obviously, again, by the way, um, I don't mind funnel. I just want to point that out, but I acknowledge that lots of people do mind it and don't enjoy it and all that other good jazz, but okay. Top lane significance, follow-up, death stance, item build. Oh, okay. Uh, so death stance is now changed. Age to the Legion, Vampiric Scepter, plus 500 gold, so it's not going to have CDR anymore, right? Uh, stats, 80 AD, 10% CD, uh, uh, oh, it, it will have CDR, okay, 50 AD, so it loses 30 AD, but it gets 30 armor, 30 magic resistance, and it keeps the 10% CDR. For basically every champion that is building Death Stance, I think they love these changes. Unique passive source, 30% of all post-mitigation damage received, uh, and takes it as damage over time. True damage source, 20% of all post-mitigation damage received from melee champions, 30% for range, and takes it as damage over time. True damage. I think every single champion that builds this item likes these changes. I, I am really trying to think of one that would dislike it. But Alawi is going to love this. Atrox is going to like it. Urgot's going to like it. Graves is going to like it. Um... I think, I think everyone likes this. I don't think anyone minds the, the 30 attack damage uh, missing in exchange for the resistances. Teleport cooldown, 360 seconds to 420 to 240 seconds. So this is obviously going to be really hard for competitive players to start getting into the habit of timing it. Can't Catch Me grants 3 seconds of 30 to 50% movement speed upon teleport completion based on character level increased by 10% at levels 6 and 11. So the first thing that comes to mind for me here is spellbook mid lane users in mid. I, I think that this is obviously being looked at as top lane, but anytime teleport gets adjusted, you have to think, what does it mean for bot laners? And also what does it mean for uh what does it mean for bot laners and then what does it mean for mid laners? And this just looks like a massive teleport buff, and even if it ends up influencing top a little bit more than the other roles, it doesn't change the fact that it will help these other roles. Having one minute slapped onto an early teleport in bot lane doesn't really matter all that much. You use the initial teleport, and then the second one you don't actually use to get back to lane typically. The second one is usually utility, and you're typically sitting on it. And then again, you're not using it immediately at level one, so the 420 seconds isn't that's that's not the number that you get. So, the nerf isn't the the nerf to the early stages isn't going to be big enough to outweigh all the other buffs. So I like that they ended up doing that. Recommended items, that's fine. ARAM balance changes, navigation icon, bug fixes, cool. All right, let's take a look at the upcoming skins because I had I know I know this is this is what we're really here for. All right, so let's take a look. Um, so we have Talon Blackwood, and it's giving me a uh a uh. Uh, blood Elf. It's giving me like a, a, a Blood Elf vibe that has rejoined the Alliance with its Paladin friend, and then you have a, 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 a Dwarven uh, Tavern owner guy back here, and then here you have some Worgen Gnome. Poor bastard. <laughs> I don't even... They're not even giving him a drink. They're just giving him cheese. Alright, so I mean, all these skins look really cute. Um, I think that uh, this Twitch skin is really, really playful and nice. I think they're about to have a very lovely meal. Um, the Talon skin, again, it just, it just looks like a Blood Elf. I think that Tarek literally looks straight out of a Disney movie, so I, I, I don't know what, what's going on there. Let's get a 
I'm just gonna say that. I, I do not know how to exit this. What? Okay. Great. Oh. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, Dark Star Malphite. Um, this looks like something out of like a Marvel series. It also has a Prestige Edition, so make sure to get that. So that when you ult your opponents, even if you fail to kill them, they'll still think to themselves, man, that guy had a Prestige Edition skin. Um, I think this looks really cool. I, it's giving me like that, uh, that Doctor Strange Dormomu, Dormra, I, I don't, I don't remember the name of the guy. It's giving me that sort of a vibe. This Lux skin looks fantastic. Dark Cosmic Lux, Cosmic Lux, Dark Star Mordekaiser, and Dark Star Zareth. What, what, why, why is Lux the only one that gets two skins? I mean, Malphite dead, but wh what? Is it not a Chroma or what? It's basically a Chroma. Wh whatever. All these skin lines look cool. I am a super, super big fan of all the Dark Star skin lines. In fact, some of them are actually so cool that I just wish it was like a champion. But all of these things just give me super awesome cosmic universe destroyer super villain superhero vibes and it's always really cool and i always love seeing it talon blackwood oh it has uh he has a surname um all of these chromas do look really cool except for this one i, I don't know this one just looks really i don't know oh it's like android 16 from dragon ball z that's what was coming to mind okay okay so it does look like android 16 um dark star Zareth. And okay, yeah, Tar really does just look like a paladin um, with his with his base kick, base skin. Uh, Tarek Lumen Shield, Twitch Shadowfoot, and then you have Darkstar Mordekaiser. I mean, all the skins look really cool there. That one even looks like uh, the Lich King, I guess, to an extent, um, which is really nice. The Zareth one actually doesn't look that cool. The chroma the chromas don't look like they make it anything totally different. And I, actually, some of these chromas even look like some of his alternate skins, which I guess is kind of awkward. So it definitely looks like his base skin or this the the white chroma is going to be the best on Zareth. But maybe maybe people have different takes. Um, Twitch Shadowfoot, yeah, I mean he definitely does look like your your pet uh, hamster or something um, who's about to do battle on League of Legends. And so that is pretty much it. This was a very long patch notes rundown we are almost at 40 minutes in terms of so i'm, I'm just gonna do uh the recap right here so in terms of competitive uh changes or changes that could actually end up being meaningful you're mostly looking at hecarim twisted fate ergot all things considered um and then soraka so it's actually these four basically are the 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 best that got help from this patch in terms of buffs obviously the draven kindred morgana uh, Vigar and Zareth changes are all nice, but I, I don't think it, it, it's really gating or preventing anything that was going on. Also, wait a minute. Why was Anivia not added as a buff? I'm done. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm done. <laughs>